All right, we're going to be starting here in our second teaching. And this teaching is going to be about dispensationalism, one of the frameworks for understanding the Bible that Sean mentioned in the previous teaching. Uh, so this is defining dispensationalism. Now, let's step back and talk about theological frameworks for interpreting the Bible. I have a chart here that's kind of going to lay out uh, what I'm calling the taxonomy of theological systems. This is just the spectrum of ways that people, uh, the systems they use to interpret scripture. And they kind of go in two different directions. Uh, one direction goes toward discontinuity, then the other direction goes toward continuity. Now, there are certain names to these various systems. Uh, going from the discontinuity end, uh, we have what's called classic dispensationalism. And then moving farther away, there's revised dispensationalism and then progressive dispensationalism. All three of these particular forms of dispensationalism are, are all under what is known as dispensationalism. Now, they have distinctions. Um, there's greater discontinuity in classical dispensationalism, such as in that there's completely two distinct peoples of God, and that God has actually two redemptive plans going in two different arenas in the world, whereas then revised dispensation comes away and has a little more integration to it, and then with progressive dispensation, you're closer to a middle ground away from the discontinuity where there's a more overlap between the programs of God's redemptive purposes in history. Now, if we go to the other side of the halfway point, we go to a covenant-based interpretation system. This is where we find progressive covenantalism. And then as we move more toward continuity, we get to covenant theology. And then finally, all the way on the far end toward continuity, we have Christian reconstructionism. And so these are the main systems that fall under covenantalism. They basically are called covenantalism because they look at the way covenants form a theological framework for understanding the Bible versus a dispensationalism that looks at dispensations. Now, we're going to be looking at new covenant theology in this class, which falls predominantly right here, right to the right-hand side of the center line under the covenantalism framework. And this includes progressive covenantalism, which will be the main form of New Covenant theology that we talk about. Now, why is all of this important? Why are these all these theological systems? Who needs all this type of stuff anyway when you read the Bible? Why can't I just pick up the Bible, look at it, and, and read and understand what it says? Well, think about it like this. You read the Bible like you read any other piece of literature, and what you're doing is you are accumulating pieces of data. You're accumulating information. And that information only has meaning if you know how it is placed in relationship to other pieces of information. You can't say you just know what one statement means in and of itself on its own, isolated from a context. The purpose for these theological systems is to be able to have a way to collate or organize all the data in the Bible and to help it be able to fit and understand how is it connected together. And as Sean mentioned, uh, we think that New Covenant theology really offers the best answer for connecting together the pieces of the storyline in Scripture. And that that is actually the organic way that the Scriptures present the storyline, and the way that the apostles looked at the scriptures and the storyline and the Christ event and what it accomplished in God's redemptive purposes. So let's look at dispensationalism as a word and term, and we'll get kind of like more focused on this particular way of interpreting the scriptures. Now, dispensationalism, here's a definition for you. Dispensationalism is a system of thought used to interpret the Bible. It considers biblical history as divided by God into dispensations, which are defined periods of time in which God administrates his redemptive plans 
and relates to humanity through certain distinct principles and revelation. Now, this might include a word you may or may not be familiar with, dispensations, that the biblical story, biblical history, is divided by God into dispensations. What is a dispensation? Dispensation, it is a distinguishable economy in the outworking of God's purpose. Now, you might think, okay, what is an economy in the outworking of God's purpose? You're using language I don't know, Jerry. Well, let me try and break it down to you this way. An economy is a way that something is run. It's a way to oversee things. It's a way for things to be interrelated and work together. And so what dispensationalism is saying is that there are distinct periods of time these dispensations where God is doing certain things, overseeing the world and carrying out his redemptive purposes in certain ways. And that is an economy in which he is working out pieces of his redemptive plan. Now, dispensationalism looks at this, this series of dispensations that you could say chunks of time as history is unveiled throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it is typically dissected into about seven time frames or seven dispensations. I would like to go through the dispensations here just so you guys understand what the most common framework is. Now, there are lots of different ways people divide up dispensations in the Bible. Uh, there are minimum of four dispensations, usually that all dispensationalists agree upon. Some go seven, some go eight, some even go as, as high as 12. And also, there's really not a uniformity agreement on exactly when the dispensations end and begin. There, there's, there's, loose, there's some gray area and loose timing, but generally they, they see these major changes all at pretty much the same points in time. But maybe if you look at the Bible, the verses and everything are a, a little bit different in various people's um, the way that they line up their dispensations. So the first dispensation is called the dispensation of innocence. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of the Bible when God creates the heavens and the earth. And in the heavens and the earth, everything is idyllic. It is perfect. There is no war. There is no suffering. Humankind and animals live in peace. Animals live in peace with each other. The, the world is just fruitful and, and abounding in, in the blessings of the way that God designed it to operate. And this carries on until Adam and Eve sin, which causes the fall and causes them to get expelled from the Garden of Eden. From that point on, the next dispensation starts, and it's called the dispensation of conscience. And this is where humankind is ruled by kind of their own self-will and their conscience. And during this time, there's all kinds of disasters. Murder enters the world. You see sin running rampant. Uh, the world becomes filled with wickedness, so much so that God decides that there's too much and we got to do away with it. And I'm going to work through an individual named Noah and his family because there's just too much evil in the world. And so then around the time that God saves Noah and his family and wipes away everybody else from upon the face of the earth, we get a transition to another dispensation. This dispensation is called the dispensation of human government. And this is a time when, again, the population of the world grows and people start building cities and, and things kind of like start escalating again and people begin doing evil again and they build the Tower of Babel. And God has to come down and intervene again in human affairs to scatter humankind and confound their languages. And so we come up to this point at the Tower of Babel when again God has to act. And he changes his program and starts anew. After the Tower of Babel, he starts with 
a man named Abraham. And this is called the dispensation of promise. Now, God works with Abraham and his descendants, Isaac and Jacob. And uh, God gives them certain promises that he is to leave his homeland and venture to a promised land that God is going to give him and his descendants. And so Abraham leaves with his family and they travel over toward the land of Canaan, the land of Palestine that God is promising them. But they never actually get to own or inherit that land that God promised them because by the time that happens, Abraham's descendants find themselves down in Egypt in slavery to the Egyptians and oppressed. And yet again, God steps down and intervenes to save them and to start another program, a dispensation. And this is the dispensation of law where God forms what's known as the Old Covenant with the people of Israel. And this Old Covenant forms a huge part of God's redemptive history. Almost 1,500 years. As you see here in the text of Scripture, we go from Exodus, which is in the early portions of the Scriptures, all the way to halfway through the New Testament in the book of Acts, and the day of Pentecost. This is the law period. But after the dispensation of law, then comes another thing God does. We know it maybe as the church age, or the age of grace, the dispensation of grace. And this is a time when God shows his favor to his people by pouring out his spirit, by by fulfilling certain promises he gave about forgiving sin, and wiping away the conscience of sin in the hearts of his people. But yet, this is not the end of the story. There is yet another dispensation that follows. And this is when the Lord Jesus will return. And God will again do another thing. And that is the kingdom, the millennial kingdom age, which begins in Revelation chapter 20. Now, you might ask, well, Is that actually the end of the story? Well, not really, but this brings things all the way up to the point of the end of the story in Revelation 21 with the new heavens and new earth and and the final eternal kingdom. So these are the primary seven uh, dispensations that most dispensationalists generally would adhere to. Now, when we have these dispensations, what does this provide somebody? Well, it provides somebody the border. It gives people points of reference. Have you guys ever done a jigsaw puzzle? The common practice, what is step one? You find all the pieces that have a flat edge, and then you put them together to form the outline of what the picture is supposed to look like. You do this because this helps give you a way to start and you know that you can look for pieces that then fit with the framework, with the border, and you can start building inward the picture. And you remember all those pieces we saw in the picture previously? You get pieces of data and you look at it and then you look at the border and you're like, oh, does it fit on this side? Does it fit on this side? Maybe it fits on this side. And it gives you a point of orientation to know how to start fitting together all of the information that you pick up in Scripture when you read. And so this then allows you to then put uh, pieces in certain places. It allows you to be able to see how God is doing certain things because you've identified ways that God is working in dispensations, and then you use that as a framework for saying, okay, if God is doing something, I'm reading this here, which part of this story and the way that I've divided it up, what part does this fit into? And that forms what is called a hermeneutic. See, a hermeneutic is just a framework or a set of principles that are used or is used in the process of interpretation. You could think of it as a sort of like a a decoding system, a way to know that if you get pieces of information, you can then filter them into categories or you can put them into groups and you know that certain things go with each other. And so that's what the dispensational framework is seeking to achieve. It's seeking to achieve a way to categorize things, 
But the way that it's done is by looking at the discontinuity. It's looking at how is everything changing along the way as God is accomplishing his redemptive purposes. Now let's talk about what is the basis of dispensationalism. What do dispensationalists adhere to? We know that there's dispensations, but how do they get to those? Where do those actually really come from? Are they arbitrary? Well, no, there's actually certain things that help dispensationalists decide what what goes where and how to divide up the story of redemption. The first and major part of dispensationalism is that they maintain a clear and distinct, uh, a clear distinction between Israel and the church. These are two different things in their hermeneutic, and they don't mix. Secondly, they use a consistent literal interpretation of a, as a hermeneutic in all areas of scripture. This is known as biblical literalism. And this works out in the sense that if something is said in scripture, then that is what it means throughout scripture. A equals A, B equals B, C equals C, and and things don't change. And this works out in the way that in the New Testament, if the New Testament authors refer to something in the Old Testament, the dispensational framework says that the New Testament doesn't change the meaning of the Old Testament. They use the Old Testament as A equals A, and they just maybe color A more, or say how A is actually fulfilled or whatnot, but A never becomes A prime. There's no, there's no modification in the system. That's what they mean by a literal interpretation. Sometimes you might read it's called a literalistic or a concrete, an unchanging interpretation. Lastly, The third major tenet is that the glory of God is the underlying purpose of God in history. So everything that God is doing in these different dispensations, dispensationalists would affirm that it's all for the way that God is glorifying himself in history. The major crux of the dispensational framework is the literal interpretation This is huge for their hermeneutic. There are a couple reasons why they feel this is the right way to interpret scripture. Philosophically speaking, the purpose of language itself seems to require a literal interpretation. Now, what this means is that language is something that was actually given by God and for the purpose of of having effective communication And so it seems unlikely they would say that God would go through the trouble of communicating in language that people can understand only then to confuse them with uncertainty and change the meaning of of those words. And so they say the literal interpretation preserves the integrity of God's revelation. Biblically speaking, They look at the prophecies of the Old Testament and specifically the ones that are messianic concerning the coming of the Messiah. And they say all of these prophecies that concern the Messiah, they say these were fulfilled literally. So prophecies have literal fulfillments and they are fulfilled in the ways that they were first given. Not that prophecy is given, and they say that, well, then it's fulfilled in a, uh, another way, for example, maybe a, a typological way or a spiritual way, or that what God referred to in the Old Testament then finds a complementary reference in the New Testament. No, 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 no. They say that the promise and the, and the prophecy is fulfilled as it was given in the way it was given originally. A equals A. B equals B. Lastly, logically speaking, if one does not use what they call the plain, normal, or literal method of interpretation, they believe that objectivity is then lost. Or you could say subjectivity is introduced. And that's a dangerous thought that that they don't want to uh, allow. They think that there would be no check on the variety of interpretations that a person's imagination could produce if there were not an objective standard, if there was not an A equals A type of principle at work 
in the interpretation. I want to talk about where in the Bible do we find dispensations? We're talking about what it is, how, how it's constructed, the various pieces that are used as a hermeneutic for interpreting Scripture, but is this something that actually has a foundation in the Scripture? The word dispensation is translated from a Greek word that you do find in the New Testament, oikonomia. And oikonomia literally means the management of a household. But in reference to God, it refers to the arrangement of his relationship with humankind and the administration of his plans of redemption. What oikonomia conveys in dispensational thinking is that God issues various programs throughout history and operates in certain ways with respect to humankind that reveal his sovereignty and his rulership and which execute his redemptive purposes. So the way that God manages the world is through these different oikonomia, these dispensations. God is showing himself to be sovereign and the ruler and is showing the way that he's redeeming his people by having these little pockets of action economies that are carrying out his overall program of redemption. Now, there are two dispensations explicitly mentioned in the text of Scripture. One is called the dispensation of the grace of God, also referred to as the dispensation of the sacred secret. We find this in Ephesians chapter 3, where it says, Surely you have heard, this is Paul speaking here, Surely you have heard of the administration of the grace of God that was given to me for you, and that the sacred secret was made known to me by revelation, as I have already written about briefly. Later on in verse 9, he says, And to bring to light for everyone what is the administration of the sacred secret, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, it says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf, and am taking my turn to complete in my flesh what is lacking in regard to the afflictions of Christ. I do this for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister in accordance with the administration of God that was given to me for you in order to make fully known the word of God. The second dispensation is called the dispensation of the fullness of times. And this you find in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, Having made known to us the sacred secret of his will, according to his good pleasure that he planned beforehand in him with a view toward the administration of the fullness of times to unite under one head all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth in him. So dispensationalism is something that is found in scriptures using this term, oikonomia, that there are ways that God is administering his plan of redemption. And that in the New Testament, specifically in the writings of Paul, we find the grounding there for that God is actually unveiling to Paul the way that he's administrating, administering his grace. Now, I want to say one thing about the idea of Israel and the church, because this becomes one of the crux issues in dispensational thinking and something which all dispensationalists adhere to. In the dispensational thinking with Israel, there are certain reasons why they think Israel and the church are distinct. For Israel, there are three things. First, it's character. They think Israel is distinct from the church because God's dealings with the nation of Israel and the descendants of Abraham are distinct from what God is doing with the Jews and Gentiles in the church age. And that they they see that when you say that God is doing something with Israel, well, Israel is A. And if you say, well, then God's doing something with this people that are Jews and Gentiles called the church, well, that's not A, that's B. And A does not equal B. And so therefore, you always keep them separate. A is always A. And B is always B. And depending upon the type of dispensationalism, sometimes A and B find themselves closer and closer together. But they never 
find themselves connecting. They're always separate. The second reason why this is in dispensational thinking is because of timing. See, there's a big thing about dispensations. They are sequential, and they're chronologically separated by time. And because of the literal interpretation hermeneutic, when something happens at point A in time, and then something else happens at point B in time, dispensationalists tend to look for discontinuity, and they separate things into categories based upon that discontinuity. And so if God is working in the Old Testament under a particular covenant with Israel, then in the New Testament with the church, and if there's a new covenant, those are separate things, and dispensationalists say that they are not to be connected together. That God is doing something at one time here and another time here, and those are two separate activities of God. And so while you can say in dispensational thinking that there are two entities there is always something that is bridging it together, and that is redemption. Everything God is doing is to redeem his creation. So there is unifying principles underlying the dispensations, but the marked differences are because of things like different descriptions in character, different times that things occur. And lastly, the major uh, component is because this new thing God is doing was not forecasted in the Old Testament in dispensational eyes. They look at the church and the things that are happening in what's known as the dispensation of grace as a secret that was not something told of in, in ancient Israel under the Old Covenant. So what God was doing with Israel, then you have this new secret thing that is being revealed that Paul is telling the church about that Gentiles are now allowed to be part of the inheritance. They're allowed to be children of Abraham, something that Jews were like, no, no, the, the Gentiles have no part with us. We're supposed to be separate from them. And so then this new plan that, is, that God is doing in the eyes of dispensationalists is looked at as like a, a, a side project that goes along with his program for Israel. So it's not that the idea that uh, God is leaving Israel behind He's saying what dispensations say is that Israel has its own, its own distinct, uh, you could say, place in God's redemptive purposes. But there's also a new place now given to the church. And God is working these things together, but separate. All right, I think that's, a, that's an overview of dispensationalism. And hopefully, uh, we, I've given you a little bit of a construct to understand how this works, the major premises behind it, the type of hermeneutic that they use to try to understand the pieces of Scripture. And next week, we hope you come back, because we're going to be talking about the strengths and weaknesses of this type of a system. What does dispensationalism do well? What is, what, what is the strength of it? How can it be advantageous for understanding the data of Scripture? And then on the other hand, well, what are its shortcomings? Where does it fail? How does it, how does it not answer certain questions? And this is what you have to do with every theological system. You have to look at, well, what is it trying to do? And how does it answer this, that, and the other? And you weigh them against each other. And that's what we want to try to present to you in this class about progressive covenantalism that we think that it helps bring together the types of things that dispensationalism helps us understand and covenantalism helps us understand. And uh, putting the, the strengths and strengths together to be able to see the scriptures from a, a new perspective that seems to bring together the organic nature of what God has done throughout history and points toward the future of the final fulfillment of everything that God has promised. For everything is yes and amen in Christ Jesus our Lord.